Good evening and welcome to Beyond the Headlines. Another lovely Wednesday evening. My name is Peter Zulu Jr. I'm filling in for Kwanguli Wewe, who's still away in New York. It's a beautiful uh, Wednesday and we're back with another exciting edition. Remember, you can follow us and be part of this conversation live on our Facebook page, Hot FM Zambia, which is live. You can add your comments and contributions. You can also uh, follow us or tweet us at Hot 877 Zambia. That's our Twitter. We'll be able to see your messages. You can follow us on DSTV channel 912 and GoTV channel 301. Those, uh, you know, platforms will allow you to be part of Beyond the Headlines. My guest today is uh, not a guest, I have to say, <laughs> in-house guest. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I would say. Uh, I'm joined by Reverend Walter. Uh, Reverend Walter, members, good, good evening and welcome to Beyond the, the Headlines. Good evening, PZ, and of course, a great greeting to all of you out there. Today, I'm greeting the normal way because this is not my show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I want us to look at a very topical subject Correct. in the country right now. Mm. Issues to do with homosexuality. Mm-hmm. And as a Christian nation, I want to start it from there. Mm-hmm. Homosexuality, Christianity, and, and, and just our way of life, our traditional norms and all that. that mm-hmm. That'll be our conversation for this evening. Mm-hmm. And that's why we decided to invite Reverend Water so that we, we see uh, you know, where this conversation is actually going. I want us to start from the beginning. You know, the second Republican president uh, declared Zambia as a Christian nation on December 29th in 1991. Mm. In a democracy such as ours, do you think that Dr. Chiluba was in order to do so, uh, you know, single-handedly or, or that he should have called for a referendum to ask the Zambian people to vote for either having a secular state or a Christian nation? Because, truth be told, uh, Rev, mm. this is a status that was conferred upon us by one man when we look back at it. Correct. And these are conversations that we need to start having as Zambians as we open up the conversation that we want to open up this evening. I want to get your take on this. Okay, so let's begin first. A lot of people don't know this, but I'm a voracious student of history. Mm-hmm. In 1965, Zambia, one year old, Kaunda made a declaration. He may not have had fanfare, pizzazz, and the whole Pentecostal movement there, but he did affirm that Zambia is a Christian nation led by Christian values. This mm-hmm. is in 1965. Yeah. So essentially, this country has always had this Christian background. And if you go even further back, you realize that even David Livingston, at his death, made a declaration through a prayer to say that the people of this land, I mean, this is in Chief Chitambo's village, as you know, Mm. 1873, he he did declare and say that may the people of this land be a people that call after the name of God, the Christian God. So there has been this seeming tendency to have this, uh, for lack of a better word, let's call it specter of the Christian nation hanging over the nation. Now, of course, when uh, Chiluba and them came into power, there was so much anti kaunda sentimentalism as well as the whole idea of getting rid of everything be up before, especially considering that between 1965 and 1991, Zambia did move from a democratic republic to a one-party participatory democracy through the changing of the constitution in, I've forgotten, 72 or 73, somewhere there. Yeah. And so this then meant that we became a one-party state. And that, as always, meant that now you had... Uh, a one-man show, for lack of a better word, and that led us down a very terrible disc- decline. So I suppose in the zeal to ensure everything to do with the Second Republic was out the window, uh, Chilua and his friends and colleagues decided that I think this is the right thing to do. And bear in mind that this is just about the period when we lost the national team. So there must have been a, a very strong sentiment for yeah, going back to God. Mm. So I think everybody kind of felt it. Uh, of course, there were circles that did oppose it and spoke strongly about it. But generally, it flew by. And uh, you know this country. We were still working on coming out of the one-party, one-man show into a democracy. So everything he did at that, at that point, people looked at it as good. Yeah, because there was still a lot of love for Chilwa and love for the MLB. The honeymoon phase. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So we're still deep so, in that. Rev, I'll ask you again. Mm. Uh, do you think this declaration should have been put to a referendum 
to allow the Zambian people decide do they I want to so. be a Christian nation Absolutely. From or a not? Governance, from mm. a governance standpoint, mm. that's the right thing to do. Because, you see, it's just that sometimes because there's so much power in the presidents in this country, they still have this power to sign stuff. So do you know, for example, that moving from the one-party state to the, to the multi-party state should have been a referendum? In 1990, when there was the famous uh, uh, Luchembe you know, scare. If you remember that, mm. uh, there was that whole thing, the coup attempt in mm. 1990, mm. June. And so September, Kaunda has a press conference and he says, we're going to go <clears throat> on a referendum. But then he decides, forget about the referendum. Let's just take the country back to multi-party state. He signs that and then he even calls the elections early. If you remember your history, 93 should have been when the next elections were due. But he called them early and said, we're going to have the elections early. And so he pushed them to 1991, and that's how 31st October became the monumental time and date in which the elections were held. So you see, the president used his pen to sign this. And so that power still remained in 93. So even though Chiluba could have run us through a referendum, he still had that power, and so he signed that. And you, and you notice something about this country. That's one of the areas where, when it comes to the issues of governance, we still have a lot of homework to remove power from the presidency. Even now, we still have that. I want to ask about, you know, this decision being made, and uh, you, you've cited two incidences. 1991, uh, Chiluba declaring uh, Zambia Christian Nation and back in 65, yes. when Kenneth Kaunda did it as well. Mm -hmm. um, do you, are our leaders, I would say for lack of a better term, short-sighted in making these decisions and not open-minded to think, okay, we're living in a state where we might actually have people that think otherwise. That's true. Should we put it to the people in 10 years' time, maybe this decision will not be relevant to the nation? We don't know, but uh, for the for tr truth be told, I mean, if you want to know, Zambia is a quote-unquote Christian mm. nation without going into the, the, the real definitions of that. Look at the reaction to homosexuality. And you, you start to realize that essentially culturally speaking and i always say this very strongly i say culturally and i use that word deliberately because this is about a culture so we're not talking about our people living according to the tenets of christian mm. nation of course heck no but the point is does the zambian public generally carry a, a christian culture yes so you realize that that's the challenge we have so until a time when that culture and mindset is no longer the predominant force in this country, it's not going to work. I'll give you very good examples. You see the traditional churches and the way they wear those uniforms, mm -hmm. the ladies? Mm -hmm. You know that's a culture? Yeah. I mean, I don't know what that has to do with the Bible. Nothing whatsoever. There's no place in the Bible where it says women that serve in the church should be wearing uniforms. But that's a culture that's stuck amongst many traditional churches. In fact, many churches, you'll be hard-pressed if you have a strong women's movement with not to have a chitenga of some sort. So, so these things are just cultural. So in the same manner, our Christianity in this nation, and I say it always without apology, is a cultural Christianity. So it's not a radical, genuine Christianity. Nope, nope, nope. So do you think, based on that, do you think declaring Zambia Christian nation was myopic? Not really, because you know why? Because it's the culture. Remember, it's the people that determine what goes in legislation. So the people drive the agenda. And remember, the representatives of the people are the MPs. They represent what the people want. Because that's mm -hmm. what democracy is supposed to be. Yeah. So if democracy states that the majority are quote-unquote Christians, and I really use that again, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if they are Christians and this is what they want, so be it. So politicians, this is why, if, and you know, for me to really like drive this point home, the previous regime, what was their calling card in the campaigns? They used religion ad nauseum. They, they really tried to show that they're the better Christians. And this is so funny, and I don't know if they thought it would work, but they really threw that on everybody's head. You know, like this is, you know, God's chosen, anointed of God. And we, 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 we declare a, a day for prayer and, fa and fasting. They even had a house of prayer, which is still coming up. But then even uh, a ministry for religious affairs, which you and I both know the word religious affairs has nothing to do with Christianity. Yeah. It has to yeah, do with, with all, religions. All the religions. Including the wizards. Yes. You know, so that's all part of religion because we call those traditional beliefs. And then you've got the Muslims, then you've got the Hindus, and then you've got, of course, the Christians. You've got a few Baha'i. You've got a few, you know what I mean? So essentially, even though that ministry was headed by a, a reverend and a Christian, 
essentially its function in its strictest sense should have been around religious affairs. So to confine it to Christianity is purely because Zambia is culturally Christian. Okay, I, I want to bring you back. Um, mm. You know, let's zero in on happenings back home here. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your analysis of how the church today is working with the new Dawn administration? Especially when you hear sentiments from, uh, I'll give two examples of two bishops, Bishop mm -hmm. uh, Alec Banda mm -hmm. and Bishop John Mambo, mm -hmm. pointing fingers over what is perceived as the relationship between the church and the state today. And I know this brought up a lot of conversation yeah. yesterday. It's a very touchy issue, uh, PZ. You, you have to realize that uh, I am an advocate of a complete separation of state and, 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 uh, and church. Why? Mm. Because history is our best example. We see it in Rome, ancient Rome. Well, okay, not ancient Rome, but you know, when when the when when the Roman kingdom, uh, you know, kingdom or empire, whatever you want to call it, uh, embraced Christianity. Mm -hmm. This is uh, in the time of Constantine, and within one century, they had merged the position of the Caesar with the bishop, mm -hmm. and the Caesar and the bishop became one entity called the papacy. It is historically true. And I know when I say this, my friends over in the Roman Catholic Church always get offended, especially those who don't know their history. But those who do, don't say much. The truth of the matter is that when the papacy came into existence, we have never historically until the 20th century seen such brutality exercised by such an entity. Merging religion with the state is a nightmare. And mm -hmm. even if you come to modern days where you have Islamic states, where uh, clerics, these are heads of uh, the clerical movement, which is basically your heads of the you know, Islamic movement mm -hmm. in those countries, are also heading the country. It's total brutality because they use Sharia. But you and I both know that human systems are replete with corruption and ineptitude. And so what inevitably happens is when you have complete total power in the hands of one entity, it is inevitable that power brokers surround that entity and use the entity to their own end. So we know that the church did not spare that as well. We had a lot of corrupt, uh, completely debauched individuals who were posing as cardinals and, and bishops, and they were corrupt at heart. And they were using the church to propagate and further their own agenda. This is also true even in the Muslim countries. This is also true in any place where religion is centerful because inevitably corruption creeps in. Why? Because mm. man is inherently evil. I don't buy into that whole thing that men are inherently good. That's not true because all you need to do is just give men enough freedom and power and you will see their corrupt nature come out. So this is why for me, the church and the state must be separate so that the church continues to be the beacon offering guidance to the state. That's how it should be, mm. even though the state governs and runs the country. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but I would like to throw in maybe, uh, let's be specific. Mm. How, how would you like your church to be working, um, you know, to be working with the current administration? Or what, what kind of relationship? Advisory. Just that. Yes. Nothing else. No, 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 no. Because you see, give a man power. It does not take mm -hmm. long before they become corrupt. And we see it every time. Why do you think there's such negative sentiment over pastors and bishops from the previous regime? Mm -hmm. You see, and all you need to do is just go on social media and mention certain names and immediately there's a visceral reaction. Why? Because of what I've just said. And that's why church should remain advisory. Now, if the church is doing its job right, in other words, if it's really proclaiming the kingdom of God, what should happen is they should be such a light that the state and those who represent the state, i.e. the politicians, will gain guidance from the church. But when the church is corrupt, and by the way, I use that term broadly, right? Mm -hmm. It's a sweeping broad term. It's not like one specific denomination. So if the church is corrupt, then it means that the individuals are corrupt. Then it means the three things God calls uh, people who are called of God to be, which is to seek justice, to have mercy, and to walk humbly. Those three things fall down. Mm. They are no longer represented by those people. Those people become a force unto themselves. They start to build little empires and sooner the corruption of the world takes over them. And that's when we end up seeing a situation where there is wanton lawlessness <clears throat> and church could not speak. It's very unfortunate. Maybe some quarters did, but generally yeah. it was a very weak voice. I like the idea of providing an advisory law uh, role mm. in, um, 
you know, uh, to, to the government yes. by the church. Yes. But is that is that is that attainable in this in this country based on what we have seen the past ten years? Where that's a very good you would question. literally say Christians were for sale or bishops were for sale, yes. or pastors were for sale. Yes. Is how how attainable is this? Because obviously we've seen in the past that it's easy for anybody to have enough money. To put, uh, or let to me just say off. to buy off the church <laughs> That's a fact. and and, and, and provide and provide advisory law uh, uh, laws uh, that that are suited for the government, <laughs> which is extremely unfortunate. PZ, you know uh, the way it happens is if the church can ensure they are a beacon to their members and then allow their members to go vie for public office. For me, that's the key mm. because then you are really being salt of the earth. Remember Jesus gave this command that be salt and light. So salt of the earth, light of the world. Mm. So salt of the earth meaning bringing you know, preservation and, and, and nourishment to earth itself, the society. So if people really live by the commandments of God, if people really live by the law of God and abide by his instruction, and then those people go into public office, we'll see better caliber politicians. But when the church itself is not being salt, when the people that are in the church are the ones advocating for the pursuit of money and the pursuit of wealth and the pursuit of luxury at the expense of people's you know, spirituality, mm. then, then that's what seems to be the most important thing. That's why many churches are muzzled because you get a very wealthy politician go into that church, become a member, and start pr- contributing money to the church. Now, how does the church speak against such a person when they are the ones who single-handedly funded their church building? They can't speak. Again, they my muzzled. question, is it attainable yes. to have the church work... It, it, it just is just an te- advisory. <laughs> it is technically, it is theoretically attainable. I, I think that's a better answer. <laughs> practically, <laughs> we are just not seeing it. We wish we, wish we could, but mm-mm. because you see, like we keep saying PZ, there is the pressures of life. You mm-hmm. know, it's amazing. Jesus gave this analogy of the, of the parable of the sower. And in the third uh, sower, he sowed into the ground, but there were thorns and thistles and they choked the seed. I like to use that analogy to refer to people that are in the church. Many of them are choked by the cares and pressures of life. Like, like the thorns, they come choke that seed. Mm. So many people start off with good intentions. I want to live and serve the Lord. I want to be faithful to God. But see, as they live in this world, you know, they say it's not the crisis that destroy Christians. It's the marathon. It's the length. It's the wearing out. It's the continuous, you know, striving for that mark of perfection. Many fall off. And okay. one great uh, preacher once said, and I loved it, he said, what is it like to walk the Christian life? He said, it's a marathon. And I said, and what does that feel like? It feels like being shot by a popcorn gun. You know, one shot doesn't really matter. Yeah. Right? But imagine being shot one million times by that popcorn gun. You will feel every kill. It becomes literally a stone. And that's the same story. I'm sure you remember they used to have what they call the water torture back in the day where they have a drop of water just dropping yeah, on your head. Your yeah. yeah, when it starts, it's nothing, right? Yeah, now, but after you, an hour, hey, it's, it's something else. It's, it's like somebody's hitting you with a hammer. Mm-hmm. That's what happens to most believers, and that's why they fall off. They, they just don't have the endurance. And that's why I say that in, in, a, in a utopia, yes. In reality, questionable. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to Beyond the, the, the Headlines, right here on your hot station of One for News. And Entertainment Rev Water joins us this evening. We're looking at uh, a few topical issues that are happening in the country, one of them obviously being homosexuality. Mm-hmm. We're looking at the church and how the, the church can work with uh, the administration of the day and what role the church can play. Mm-hmm. Uh, as we continue our conversation, I encourage you to continue sending us those messages on our Facebook Live. Uh, you can send us or tweet us at hot at hot eight seven seven Zambia on Twitter. Feel free to do so and listen to us live on GSTV channel nine one two, Go TV channel three zero one, and uh, be part of this conversation. Uh, let's move on. One of the most uh, prevailing issues of our time is how the church and the state responds to the issue of gay rights or homosexuals. Yes. What's your position on this? Now, let's begin. Do you want the biblical position or as do you the want Rev. Walter? As the church. Oh, as the church. Of course, yeah. they take on the biblical position. Mm-hmm. The biblical position is homosexuality is a sin. And so if it's a sin, like all other mm-hmm. sins, because you know, the funny thing about this fight against homosexuality, and I've said it and been even accused of supporting homosexuality, which anybody who knows me knows I don't. We'll, we'll get but, to the Rev. Water side. Okay. I want to hear from the church because I've the got a few questions for the church. The position is very simple. Mm-hmm. It is a sin, like all other sins. So because it is a sin, therefore we abhor it, we condemn it. The only difference is you don't condemn the sinner. 
you condemn the sin. So okay. in the words of a lot of great speakers, they uh, God hates homosexuality, the sin itself, not the sinner, not the homosexual. Okay. He loves the, uh, the homosexual. I've, I've so that has always got to be a very clear understanding. I want to throw in something there, Rev, mm. because so many churches that we have in this country came from the West. Correct. And we have churches in the West that mm. have churches here. And the, those branches end in the apparent churches. They have embraced it. They have embraced it. They yes. allow it. Yes. What will stop the churches that were, you know, w- w- I call them branches. Mm. The branches that, you know, uh, grew in this nation from those parent churches from supporting this homosexuality. They took a very strong stand. I mean, one of the most famous, well-known cases is the Anglican Church. I mean, and you know, the Anglican Church has got a very, very large uh, uh, what, what you call, constituency mm-hmm. in Africa and Zambia as well. In, in, back in the early 2000s, there was a crisis in the church and it literally almost split the church. So the, the, the then head of the church, which is, of course, the, the, the Archbishop of, of Windsor, of, I've forgotten where he's from, but from Britain, mm-hmm. decided to allow the, the, the fellowship to kind of split without separating. So the Anglican church in Africa, Asia, and South America is anti-homosexual, with the exception of South Africa, in, in Africa. And then, of course, Europe... Australia and America, which is the Episcopal Church, mm. those have embraced homosexuality. So we have a split. And uh, that split was permitted. So the whole entire family of the Anglican Church in Africa has completely vehemently rejected it, like I said, with the exception of South Africa. So that's the story. With, with that example, then how, how can you explain to um, uh, a non-believer or just an ordinary, a layman Mm-hmm. Uh, why one institution that belongs to one God with one Bible with one Bible is split <laughs> on on such a very very cardinal issue? Because the answer is very simple because of the corruption of the church. Remember, we just came from talking about yeah. that. Yes, so we cannot avoid that. And you know, Jesus basically gave us uh, uh, a prediction or a prophecy in Scripture to say, "In those days, there shall arise an apostate church." So, essentially. Literally from the time of the birth of the church, there's always been two branches of the church. There's been what, what I call the genuine remnant of the church, mm-hmm. and there is the false church. And to prove that, one of my favorite passages is the book of uh, John, First John chapter 2, verse 18, which said that you have heard that the spirit of the Antichrist is upon the world, and even now he is actively in the world. They operate with the spirit of Antichrist. They came from us, but they are not of us. Because if they were of us, they would have done what we teach. Mm -hmm. But they do it differently. So, So in other words, John himself, the one last great apostle who was used to author the book of Revelation, amongst others, said it himself that there will arise a false remnant, a false group that are going to go around. In fact, they're not the remnant, they are the majority. So we are at a place now, my brother, where in every church we have imposters. In every church we have false people and they are sheep in wolf's clothing. And Jesus did not even uh, uh, be wary to say it. He said that there are many who are going to come to me in that day and say, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not do signs and wonders? Now imagine, so Mm. these guys are even doing miracles, but Jesus says, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And that's the word I want right there. Lawlessness. What is lawlessness? Lawlessness is where one has a deliberate disregard for the law. And I mean, we don't want to start sounding like Old Testament bashers here, but what is the law? We know the law. God gave a very clear law. Ten commandments plus almost 600 plus laws. We know what the conduct was supposed to be. So if, the, if God clearly says that anyone who sleeps with a man as a woman should be put to death because it's an abomination, if God says so, in his Bible, and it's very difficult to remove those parts of the Bible because mm. there's enough both in the Old and New Testament, where he talks about the abomination of homosexuality, the abomination of adultery, the abomination of fornication, the abomination of idolatry. And I'm picking these items because they are very cardinal. They all sit on the same line in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9. If these are abominations, but they are practiced in the church today, because we know there's homosexuality in the church. You talked to, you said it already. There are priests who are being ordained as homosexuals. Can you imagine that? Mm. And then we've got adultery. I mean, it's rampant in the church. And there are churches where they even know, 
Ah, uh, that man, that's his my nini. They both go to the same church. He's even a red jacket or a blue jacket or a, or a nail something or, jacket. You know, yeah. whatever. Yeah. And, and it's known. And then the fornication, goodness, not even, let's not even go there. It's, nobody even frowns at it anymore. Like, fornication, what's that? What does that mean? Mm. No. Oh, that's when you sleep with people. Oh, you mean that's a sin? Of course it's a sin. Oh, really? You know, that's how mm. crazy times have changed. Idolatry, let's not even start. The church is replete with idolatry. If the church is doing these things, my brother, that tells you we have a compromised church. It's that simple as that. That's I, I want to hear Rev Water's side. Uh, you, you, spoke, you spoke as a church. Um, what's your take? What's your position on this issue to do with uh, homosexuality? Homosexuality. 100% in line with what the Bible says. The mm. Bible is very, very clear. We, but, but you see, even as we speak against homosexuality, we must remember they too need the grace of God. So there has to be a really good balance. The sad part and this is what I hate about religion. The sad part about religion is people take on what I call a righteous indignation. Mm. And then righteous indignation is a sense where you feel holier than thou. So you use it as a way to kind of brandish people and label them and, and persecute them actually. Because to be honest, and I was telling somebody the other day that whilst I agree that we should march in protest, don't call it an anti-gay agenda. Because for me, what you're doing there essentially is robbing those people of their right they have a right according to secular law they may be a minority we may not like them but they do have a right their only issue is they've chosen to do deplorable things but in the argument of many of them they say well it's it's two between two agreed grown men fine but the law is against that but as an individual i always say the problem i have with the whole movement is when they want to impose their beliefs their stuff on my children there we go to war mm. and for me this is a fight for family because they're doing it if you can introduce a gay character in pepper pig i mean i'm still mourning over that because yeah. i mean pepper pig is such a beautiful beautiful little cartoon for preschoolers why would you go and introduce a, a same-sex couple do we have same sex couples all over the world no there are very few i mean this group is less than one percent now they want to make the minorities impose their will over the majority. I mean, for me, that is just wrong at all levels. So you do not infringe the rights of my children to teach them what is not right. Because for me, they are my children. PG, those are your children. Mm. You have a right as a parent to determine what you want to teach your children. If, if, I'm, if, if somebody is, a, is an atheist and they don't want their kids to grow up learning Christianity, that's their right. Because they are atheists. But I, wanna, I, wanna I don't throw think they it, yeah. should impose that atheist position on my kids when I'm a believer in the existence of God. Again, are we being myopic on this subject when it comes to our children and their generation because they will live in a different world? That's true. I, for me, I believe the Bible is very clear. You know, and forget about the Bible. Let me go completely secular. Let's go psychology. Mm. Psychology shows that between the ages of zero and seven, children are most impressionable. This is the age called the age of forming. They are formative years. This is the, year, the age when children form their character, they form their mindset, they form their world viewpoint. And the Bible says, train up a child in the way it should grow. And when it grows up, it won't depart. Mm -hmm. The onus of how a child grows is on the parent. One of my favorite examples of all time, and this is again secular, the film, uh, uh, gosh, what's that movie? With uh, Cuba Gooding Jr., Ice Cube, and, and, uh, and Lawrence Fishburne. The name is just gone. Boys in the Hood. Boys in the Hood. That's yeah. right. In I, I wanted to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm now, thinking, oh, okay, one yeah. One of the things I love about Boys in the Hood, and this yeah. is just pop culture and its lessons. Yeah. Those who may not know the story, which, you know, you wonder where you crowed from. But anyway, Boys in the Hood is a story about a father who lives in the ghetto, so to speak, uh, Compton to be specific. Mm. And uh, he's got a son called Trey. Trey lives with his mom. Uh, I think it was Angela Bassett play, playing the mom. And uh, she has issues with the son. So she says, you know what? I think it's they're, they're separate with the father. She says, it's time you go live with your father so that you get some manly, you know, you know behavior. So I'm sending you to Compton. Compton! Yes, Compton. So Compton is like the ghetto here. So he's sent to Compton to his father, but the father is an upright, one of those national Islam type focused black men, you know, men who believe in working hard and principles. And so across the street are a bunch of boys. <laughs> it's Ice Cube, Doughboy, and you know, the, the mm. character played by, uh, what's his name, the other actor. There were a number of them. Mm. But these guys had no mother. They had a mother, sorry, they had no father. They had a mother, but they were kind of free doing whatever they wanted. And there's a speech I love in that film. Uh, I, uh, sorry, um, Lawrence Bishop Fishman's character, Trey's father, is telling Trey something. 
He tells Trey, listen, Trey, you're going to work here. You're going to have to mow the lawn. You're going to do this. You know, he just gives him all these bunch of rules. And then Trey says, but dad, pops, why, why are you sweating me, man? Why are you giving me all these rules and stuff of what to do? What do you have to do? So he gives him a list. Then he says, but that's not fair. Look at those guys. So he points at mm. Doughboy and his brother and all of them playing around, doing whatever they want, going home whenever they want. And he says, look at them. They're free. You're sweating me. You're giving me pressure. Then the father says, and hear me well, he says, you see those boys? They have no man to show them what it is to be a man. Watch how they turn out. Ah, I mean, that line for me is just profound because we know by the end of the movie, the one brother that was promising is shot dead over some stupid gang fight. And then his brother goes to do revenge. They kill the other guys. And then two weeks later, we know that he too gets killed. So in short, that woman lost all her children to gang violence. Yeah. And, and Trey went on to graduate and went on to be responsible. And that will happen with our, with our kids if Correct. there's no guidance. If there's no guidance. And that's my point exactly. So meaning right now we have a crisis, I admit. Men are a rare breed right now. Many kids are being raised single-handedly by single moms. This is a bomb and a crisis in waiting. But see, that's how the, ad, the family has been attacked. Disable the man. And they're doing that powerfully. And then the next stage is disempower the man. And I call that the, the, the new thing now, make, turning men into simps and, and essentially just removing everything manly about them, emasculate them in short. Okay. And so that's what's going on. And that's why then, then the, the ultimate emasculation is when you turn a man into a woman by making him re begin to, to, to do these acts they call homosexuality. For me, that's the ultimate. Okay. Uh, President Hagan Eishilema has strongly you know, uh, made it clear that his government does not support or condone gay rights. Do you think this is a, a sincere position? Because a lot of people are saying, there's a school of thought, mm -hmm. saying we're seeing the rise in gays, lesbians, and homosexuals and, and their tendencies under the administration with little or no action from government, despite such acts being criminal under the law as it stands. I'm going to uh, quote, uh, I saw a post mm -hmm. before you answer that. I just saw a post from... Um, somebody from the civil society, I think she's a commissioner now, mm -hmm. Madam Laura Meaty, that said, yes. I, I suspect this issue to do with uh, this sodomy or whatever's going on mm -hmm. is like gassing, where somebody yes. is just pushing this agenda Correct. and government should investigate it. So as you, as you respond to this, I would also want you to touch on that if all you right. think they, they are connected in how all of a sudden there's a heightened there's high, okay. report and incidences. Okay, so let's start with... The, there's this increased tendency. I disagree because I grew up in Kabwata. <laughs> 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 because I grew up in Kabwata and as far, and imagine, I mean, when I was a teenager in Kabwata, that's like yeah. way back, right? That's like late 80s, early 90s. We knew all the homosexuals. We knew them. The, the, many of them were, of course, doing it for money as evidenced by the song, mm. by what's his name, Danny. Danny. I mean, Danny was singing what was already prevalent in society. It's just that it was kind of like under the rafters, but it was there. We knew the homosexuals. We knew where they stayed. We knew that was their lifestyle. I mean, even some of the prominent members of society, we knew who were homosexual. We knew them. It's just that it was kind of like, you know, hush, hush, quiet, but it was known. And so... To turn around and say that now there's a greater prevalence, no. Now we have social media. That's what people have to understand. In the past, news was 100% controlled by the major outlets, which was your daily newspapers and, of course, your national broadcaster. So if they decided not to talk about it, you didn't hear about it. But it didn't mean it didn't happen. But now social media has completely changed the terrain. It means now things that happened quietly now are breaking before anybody can even try and control it. Mm -hmm. So there's this sudden spreading of news and then because of that what has happened is some subversive elements this is this cannot be discounted some subversive elements know how to do what we call social engineering through the use of social media they are very good at it so they in fact they are so good that at one point there was a whole big hearing in the u.s where certain companies were bought to book to explain about this and companies were closed companies were fined for the use of data to engineer the thinking of a particular group of people. Very smart. Mm. So they use algorithms, they use AI. So they're doing this very powerfully. So when you see the prevalence of such news, it is because it's a trending issue. That's a term which didn't exist before because we didn't have a way of measuring it. Yeah. But now you can measure something called trending. Trending is anything that goes viral and goes all over the place. The sad thing about trending news is that it doesn't wait to check whether it's true or not. I mean, 
You, recently, you and I were just laughing over an issue that just popped up a few days ago where somebody was apparently raped to death. Mm. And, and then now, uh, the, 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 the source of that news comes out and says, sorry, the people that issued the news were wrong. Now, imagine that doesn't even matter anymore because that news has gone out. Mm. Now, what does that do? And that's where I see now Madam Laura Mitty's point and I think I agree with that, that there are social engineers at work. Because it's funny how certain quarters of, 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 of our society today are calling the current regime as supporting this position of homosexuality. When the president has said, I mean, what, did, what do you want the president to jump off a building to prove that he doesn't support it? Mm. So, so, but the point is, there are quarters that will use this for political expedience. We know that. And so if the stories on sodomy are going to inflame society, they will do it. I don't want to, I don't want to over-speculate, but it is a known fact that the gassing incidences reeked, reeked of social engineering. Why do we say so? Because no one even proved that people were being gassed. But what happened all of a sudden is there was this massive social fear. Zambia has always suffered from that problem. If you go back... 2016, we had the Mansa riots. I, I don't, it's just people forget. 2014, we had the riots in, in, uh, in uh, Mandevo. And it was always somebody was caught with the part of a human being in the fridge, and all of a sudden the public goes mad, mm. and all oh, these are ritualists, and then all of a sudden there's mobs and they start killing people. I mean, this is not the first time it's happening. I still remember the Mansa ones. They were very sad. And if you start to study those, including the most recent gassing incidents, you realize that someone must be at play sowing these seeds. The sad part is that in Zambia, we just don't have proper commissions of inquiry where cases are pursued to their conclusion and a report is given so that we really know. Because all these ritual incidents from the past, why would they start? What would be the issue? And why is it always that they start and then mobs go mad and then people get killed and then the whole thing just goes wild and they have to end up sending you know, special forces to go and quell all the chaos. Mansa was terrible. There were, there were gangs of people running around looking for anybody rich or anybody with finances to just burn them and kill them. And they did that to several people. We know that it happened in Mansa. This gassing incident was even worse. You know that brought the country to almost a standstill. Yeah, it was yeah, very. It was scary. terrible. It was terrible. very scary. You even feared to go anywhere just in case they accuse you of being mm. a, a so-called ritualist. Yeah. But nobody had proof of that. And then when the case started looking like it was going somewhere, when the information started coming out, I still remember. I mean, the beauty about social media is those things are there. Smart Eagles produced a, a, a mini press conference hosted by Ray Hamonga, where he claimed they had caught one of the masterminds, and there were some people that were arrested, sixteen, and they were going to get to the bottom of it. The next thing, to, you know what happened to that guy? You know, he got transferred, mm. and then that case went cold. And now we know the current police commissioner said that they are resuscitating it, but hey, that's about it. I mean, if they can't find the two girls that were abducted, the mobile money guys, mm. what makes you think they're going to find the gases? Oh, okay. The truth of the matter is that it is said that they know who they are, but the ties are too strong. Okay. And to um, get implied. I want to bring you back to uh, the UPND. Yeah. Oh, okay. I want to bring you back to the UPND. UPND. <laughs> Homosexuality, then government. So we, we, we have to throw them in. Yes. Um, would you call it a case of guilt, uh, guilt by, or guilty by association for the UPND party, which is a, it's, it's, it's a member of the Africa Liberal Network, yeah, a group of political parties that support gay rights. Yeah. Now, it is a fact that the UPND belongs to uh, the Africa Liberal Network, mm -hmm. and they have not denied it. No. So could, there be, could their membership be part of the reason why uh, they are seen not to be or not to being effective in dealing with the challenge at hand? I wouldn't know because obviously I'm not a member of the European team. Yeah, yeah, yeah obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. here's the thing. You know, like you rightly put it, guilty by association. It's a mm. terrible thing, right, to be guilty yeah. by association because if, if you're hanging around certain people, I mean, I'll give an example, and I know for saying this, this will probably make news and I'll get shot for it. But here's the thing. Did you know that one of our bishops in this country has been accused, and I'll name him. This one I know because we speak all the time. Mm. Bishop Joshua Banda has been accused of being the chief patron of the Christians for Lungu. That is an absolute outright lie. I know it's a lie. Why? Because history is present. 
evidence is present that when they were running the board of the house of God, a house of prayer, so mm. house of prayer, two, bish, two, two members of that uh, particular board decided to start house of prayer. And, I, and I'll, I'll be specific, this is in the public domain, so mm. it's not something to hide. Uh, one of them was Bishop, uh, Bishop J- uh, Peter, Peter Njovu of mm. the Bigoka Church, and the other one is uh, uh, Dr. Madam Lea Motale. These two individuals uh, started the Christians for Lungu movement. And so because they started it, what happened was Bishop Njovu and the late Reverend Pukuta Mwanza indicated and asked that uh, these individuals step out of the house of prayer because they would be compromising their position as a board, as board members. They had interest. So a press conference was held and they were asked to leave and that was recorded and ZNBC covered it. Today, do you think people know that story? No. No. What, do they, what story do they know? They say that they call him a cadre. Mm. So do you see what social engineering can do to destroy somebody's reputation, which is based completely on untruth? So Bishop Banda to this day has to walk around as a suspect of being a supporter of the previous regime when it is a fact that even to see the head of state, even for him, was extremely challenging. And on many occasions, he never got to. And of course, it's on record that their whole board was dissolved anyway. So it's guilty so by association. Even, so exactly. This so could that's be, where this now could be, brings the UPND thing. Yeah, you're saying this could be <laughs> the reason why the UPND are in this predicament. Exactly. They are in that predicament. You remember that even uh, the late President Sata was accused of supporting homosexuality at one point yeah. by the MMD. Yeah, a lot, ridiculous, actually. Ridiculous. Yeah. Ridiculous in every way. But that's how politics is. So there's a lot of people that play a lot of smart games. And, you know, social media and social engineering, if you've got the money, you can create any story and it can stick. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in a democracy where, you know, the majority rules, mm. what would you do if uh, we decided to subject the Christian nation status to a vote and the majority decided that Zambia should be a secular state? Yeah, well, let it be. That's, that's, would that's, you accept such an, such yes, an outcome yes. based on uh, the, 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 the examples that you gave us earlier with our cultural practices the, the, in nature what, that, as that, being Christians? That, that would mean that the culture has shifted because mm. you must remember that uh, culture is liquid. So even if we say, oh, our culture in Zambia, like, really, is it really our culture? I mean, we've been watching a lot of Nigerian movies. We've got a lot of Nigerian churches. <laughs> we've got a lot of American hip-hop. So, so you can't really say it's 100% mm. authentically, locally based. No, we are affected by media in every way and shape and form. Music, entertainment, uh, politics, religion, these are affecting us. So we're b- it's a hodgepodge of change in cultural nuances and beliefs. So if in 10 years' time... Zambia is more secular than it is Christian, then by all means, I mean, that's what secularism is about. I mean, this brings it's in my next democracy. question. Yeah, this brings in my next question. Now, Rev. <laughs> Come on, guys. You know, when, when the laws, because we're, we're a Christian nation. Yeah. So when the laws of man come, come, come in cl- conflict with uh, the laws of God, mm. who should the people obey? God. I ask this because we have seen so much emphasis of late on human rights yes. by many countries yes. even at the level uh, you know of the united nations but uh, we're yet a very little concern of of god's commandments Correct. here do so you know as why? a christian nation mm. where do we stand let me tell you something about the world people have to understand this jesus himself said to pilate and i quote you know pilate asked him and said why aren't you talking don't you know i have the power to let you go i have mm. the power to free you and jesus says you have power because it's been given you But this, what you see now, is the God of this age. The God of this age is the one that has the power because it's been given him to come over the Son of Man. So people have to realize that we live in a world where there is a God. It's not God Yahweh. There is a God that contends for this world and the souls of men, and his name is Lucifer. And he works hard, and he is in every system across this planet. Mm. Uh, Every system, and I mean that. And he has power. And he has authority. And he has the means to sway the hearts and minds of people. And this is something the Bible has taught. The church is the salt on a dying earth, on a hurting earth. And those who see that salt and sense that light come to the light. But the majority will continue to walk in darkness. That is a fact. And so most of the systems in this world today answer to Lucifer, not God. And so the systems are hard at work to program and to change people's viewpoint on God, Yahweh. One common method being used in Africa now, very powerful, is the one of 
equating Christianity to imperialism and the imperialistic thinking. I always argue very strongly. I agree that the imperialists used Christianity as a tool to oppress Africans. True, 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 true. But they did it as evil people. So you cannot equate the love of God with mm. the evil of the imperialists. So the imperialists used it just the same way, sorry to say, just the same way as the previous regime was using Christianity as an excuse to justify their re- leadership. See where I'm going? Uh, I've seen where you're going. <laughs> is, is that fair? <laughs> no, but it's a is fa- that a fair comparison? No, no, but well, okay, of course those were terrible. Those, those were those, extreme in yes. the past. But do you know that yeah. if you give any people enough power and enough time, they inevitably end up like the slave drivers mm. because they will always find a way to justify their evil. I mean, I, I, hear, I hear people that I think are people of the cloth defending the previous regime. Now, I'm in no way here a praise singer because I've been accused of that. I am not a praise singer, but give, his, give credit where it's due. And one thing for certain is that every time you allow people, because of their depravity, they will always lose it and they'll become lured by money and power. Okay. And inevitably they lose their, their, their senses. I, I, I want to throw in this. Um, almost all religions or regions, including Islam, Judaism, Christianity, mm. Mm. part of Christianity, let me, let me put that in inverted commas, mm. condemn homosexuality. Yes. Now, from a religious, religious perspective, mm. what is it about this practice that makes it so abominable before God. I believe because it's unnatural. And I don't care what the, 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 the homosexual movement says. It is unnatural. Because in the words of Miles Monroe, an exit is an exit. <laughs> it's not an entrance. I mean, it's not designed to receive stuff. That's why it's so sensitive. That's why it's so subject to infections and all sorts of things. And mm. a lot of people practice anal penetration and all mm. sorts of things, they suffer a lot of diseases. That's why many illnesses begin with people who practice that. Because that place is not for exiting i'm sorry for entering it's for exiting Mm. and that's how it was designed and that's why you can't conceive using that entrance because it's not natural so that unnaturalness of the act is what makes it abominable for starters but it goes even deeper there's also a theological meaning to this homosexuality is 100 percent anti-creation because when God created sex, it's for procreation. That's, that's the primary purpose of sex. It has pleasure to it, but it's procreation. In other words, through sex, life comes. Correct or not correct? Mm. Animals, you name it. It's sex. So when you take away the power to procreate, you have been come anti-God. And why am I not surprised? If you look at the qualities of the Antichrist himself, according to Daniel 11, you see that he had no love for women. If you look at the symbol of of the Antichrist and the symbol of Luciferianism, it's Baphomet. Baphomet is an androgynous creature. It has both male and female genitalia. That's why it is transgender. So I always say that the whole trans movement is an anti-God movement in its purest form and shape. And because it's anti-God, it's anti-creation, you cannot create humanity through that. They have to use biotech and bioengineering to create humans. So meaning you take uh, you know, seed from a man, find a donor woman, and you know, plant it in another human being, and then let it grow. But you cannot naturally procreate through such. So imagine if the whole world was full of homosexuals, gay and lesbian. Would we have procreation? No, they no. have to use science. No. Yeah. They have to use science. Which brings me to the other agenda of the transgender agenda. We call it the transhuman agenda. Because you see, uh, these people who are pushing this agenda believe that humans are now evolving to the next form of humanity called homo techno. So right now we're homo sapiens, but we're going to be moving to homo techno. So meaning man is going to begin to merge with machines. We call those cyborgs. If you remember the yeah, cyborg movies, yeah. that stuff is going to happen if, if, this, if this trajectory continues. And homosexuality, the transgender agenda, this is what they're pushing. And for your own information, that's the agenda that has also been adopted even by the United Nations. So you have to understand that we're dealing with a very powerful agenda at very high levels. As we bring this to a close, Rev, yeah. um, there's this argument because of what we've just talked about right now. <laughs> there's this argument that those of our friends who are gay mm. are born that way. Yes, uh, You're a learned man. Uh, mm. Not just in the ways of God, but in the ways of science. Mm. 
Do you agree with this assumption that the people that there are people that are born gay and there are people that are born if it's a man is born a woman if it's a woman is born a man? Okay, so the intersex thing is yeah. true. Yeah. The intersex is true, but if you study the history of intersex uh, state, it is something to do with a genetic disorder. It is something that goes wrong at genetic level and causes both sexes to appear. Usually, it's a fused twin, mm. but obviously, Doctor Mjajati can explain these things better. But many times, it's a fused twin. So, meaning. There was supposed to be a, a twin, twin then, and then something happened. Mm. This has also been di- shown to have been caused by a lot of chemical harm to the environment. A lot of people from the Philippines and the Asian countries, because of whatever they were eating in the 50s and 60s, that stuff messed up with a lot of people's uh, biology and started to cause the appearing of these intersex people or she males, if you like. Very unfortunate situation. Now, let's talk about the homosexuals because those, the intersex people, it's not by choice. They're just born that way. That we can't even argue. It's an anomaly. We just have to deal with it. You know, it's like disability of some form. Okay. Are people born gay? Are there people that That's are born gay? That's the one. That's the one yeah. I want to talk about. So gay is the one where people choose to be attracted, or maybe they say they don't choose, but whatever the case, they claim that they're attracted mm. by people of the opposite sex. Enough studies, which the 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 the, 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 the LGBT movement don't like to admit, enough studies have been done to show that a lot of people who develop sexual uh, attraction to fellow sex uh, is a, the result of an incident in their childhood. It has been demonstrated that children who are molested, children that are sexually t- taken advantage of in childhood, end up developing those type of tendencies. This is provable. I'm not making this up. They just don't want to admit it. Then you've also got those that are affected by the environment that they find themselves in. Because these two factors are critical. The environment and what it promotes and the trauma of sexual abuse in childhood. These two create that state spiritually i can answer the answer is because homosexuality procreates by uh, conditioning by priming by changing children into itself so when men you know through pedophilia sleep with small boys Mm. they then supplant that spirit in, in those the, children. And so when they grow up, they find themselves having an attraction for men. Would I be it right to because describe were, this? It was imprinted in childhood as they saw an erection as a small child or would, an adult. Would I be right if I said this was a perversion? Yes, 100%. For me, anything that's abnormal is a perversion. That's why in the, in the, in the gay movement, there's what they call the queers. A queer, that English term queer means unusual. It means off normal. And queer is where you find your bondage, domination, the BDSM movement. It's where you find your fetishes, you know, people with fetishes. I mean, somebody was talking about it the other day that people would, sorry to use this, but defecate into mouths of people. I mean, anybody who's going to have sex and defecate in the mouth of another human being, you're, you're sick. S- sorry, sorry to say that. I mean, that's not a politically correct term, but do, do normal people do that? No. No. So the fact that you can do that, the fact that you can tie women in cages and make them go in, 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 in chains. and I mean, this, this stuff is perversion. This is mentally depraved people. These are debauched. These are depraved and de- totally deplorable human beings because it's not normal. That's why it's done secretly. Pedophilia is the ultimate goal of these people because they know that when you get those children early, you program them, you imprint in them the tendency for homosexuality. Rev, I'd like to thank you very much for coming through <laughs> to be on the so headlines. Much. Indeed, thank you so much and I'm honored to be here. All right, there you have it. That's our show for today. We had Rev Water come through uh, for Beyond the Headlines this evening. I've been your host. My name is uh, Peter Zulu Jr. We'll be back next week, Wednesday, with another exciting edition of Beyond the Headlines right here on your hot station, number one for news and entertainment. Remember to uh, continue uh, listening to Radio After Six with Nono Zaza and Mwewa.